this computer. Yeah. Okay, we are recording everybody. Thank you. Okay. So all set. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think uh, we got people from uh, all around the world. Uh, my name is uh, Pejma Shwebi Omrani. I'm working at uh, TNO as a senior scientist. I have a background in mechanical engineering and uh, applied mathematics from Delft University of Technology. And I've been working on several topics related to the subsurface energy uh, production systems, mainly focusing on production optimization uh, from uh, different type of systems, ranging from mature uh, oil and gas assets and since a few years ago, we are uh, looking uh, um, into geothermal assets and how uh, new technologies, innovations can help the operational cost to be minimized. Uh, as I said, I'm working for TNO. For those who don't know, TNO is a Dutch uh, research institute for applied sciences. Uh, and uh, within TNO, we are working on various uh, societal uh, challenges, which, of course, energy and material transition is one of them, if not the biggest one. Um, and within our unit, we are focusing on different energy commodities on how we can make them available and optimize them for the for the, for the society. So it's really ranging from subsurface production systems to, to hydrogen, to carbon capture, to industrial heat. So it's really a broad range. So I'm coming from, from the group which focusing on optimizing the um, energy production from subsurface assets. And the topic of my talk is about heat is on, the wider role of operational expenditures and strategies for an effective resource management. So the whole thing is, of course, the heat is on because everybody is talking about geothermal. It's a very hot topic. It's a topic that attracts a lot of people from, let's say, uh, petroleum industry, from non-petroleum industry, from water sector. Uh, and also a lot of students are now looking into this topic to see if this could be, a, let's say, a future uh, a career for them. Uh, what my talk is about uh, is it's not just that the heat is on, you want to keep it on. It's not just to make sure that we can get a geothermal well and we can finance it and then that's it. You want to keep producing from your geothermal system, mainly because of the security of the supply. And that's often not a very easy task. So I would like to talk about that. What are the challenges that might impact the word heat is on and how you can keep it on? That will be my, uh, my talk. What I'm going to talk about today I will give a very, very, very brief introduction to geothermal energy. I'm not going to go into the details of that. There are lots of things that you can read about it. You can follow. So I'm not going to, uh, let's say, make a lecture about the, into the, about the geothermal energy. This is mainly just to give you a bit of a perspective. Why is it important? And what is the type of geothermal energy system that is specifically in the Netherlands? We are looking into them as of now. I will give you an overview of operation and production issues in the geothermal systems and also a lot of flow assurance challenges. So for people coming from petroleum sector, this uh, word, I guess, invented by Petrobras is a quite a familiar term, how you can get this uh, flow assurance challenges in the system and uh, how you can actually mitigate and control them in geothermal systems. And you would see some similarities, you see some differences. So I would... Uh, also uh, talk a little bit about this. And in the end, I would like to go a little bit into how we can actually turn these operational challenges into opportunities for our geothermal systems. And uh, I would like to wrap the whole thing up by a question whether actually geothermal is a sustainable energy source or not. And I would like to prove that with some facts and figure and already to give you the answer, yes, it is a sustainable energy source, but uh, wait till the end that I can also show you some figures about it. All right, so geothermal energy. There are various ways that you can actually uh, uh, categorize geothermal energy. Um, this is a one uh, picture that I kind of borrowed from uh, my friend uh, Alex Danielidis from uh, University of Delft. And uh, you can see the different type of uh, uh, systems uh, from the left where you have mainly the direct use of heat. So these are the hydrothermal systems that you actually produce from a uh, uh, from a sedimentary aquifer. You utilize the heat directly, and then you just inject it back into the subsurface. 
And as you go further to the to the right, you start to see systems with much higher temperature and also higher energy content. So what's higher enthalpy that you can actually extract from the systems. And if you have, let's say, good reservoirs, uh, you can actually, uh, from these naturally fractured systems, uh, already produce uh, temperatures above 200 degrees, which are, these sort of systems are very good for power production. So you can actually couple it directly to um, uh, kind of an organic ranking cycle systems and already directly produce power from this. Well, if your, let's say, reservoir is not uh, up to the, let's say, um, characteristic that you were looking for, there are also this enhanced geothermal system that you can actually uh, improve the permeability of your reservoirs in order to still get sufficient flow in the system. And there are other way of classifications as well. So based on the temperature, based on the enthalpy, but I think I'll this just give you a bit of a feeling that you can have systems which are directly being used for heating purposes and you can have systems that goes for the power production and often you see that sometimes there are power production system which they use the um, injection water temperature as a kind of an additional heat for heating purposes so then you kind of get it into a dual mode so these are a way of a classical um, uh, classification of the geothermal system, but of course there are some uh, new uh, type of geothermal, like the advanced geothermal or even super, geothe super critical geothermal systems are coming. Uh, some people even call them uh, unconventional geothermal. Uh, these are really about, uh, uh, the whole thing is about how you can uh, tap into this energy from the subsurface. And in this advanced geothermal system, so I take this example from uh, either a Canadian company where they try to actually build this massive um, heat exchanger under the ground. And in that way, they don't have to deal with all this uh, uh, geothermal brine that you have to actually produce from the aquifer, which can contain a lot of, let's say, uh, minerals and materials that can give you some uh, headaches. So in this way, they try to make this advanced geothermal systems or even this uh, uh, picture I took from uh, Clean Air Task Force, where they want to actually look into geothermal potentials in the supercritical uh condition so you're already talking about above uh, 400 degree, degrees above uh, roughly 270 bars so this is really let's say a novel way of looking into geothermal because this sort of energy you can in principle find it everywhere so depending on the <coughs> temperature that you're producing there could be different applications uh so i need to talk about water drying and i talk about the steam system there is a kind of the temperature range into this uh, when we look into this direct use, uh, you already see temperatures limited to 120, 30, 140 max. And it can be used for space heating, for district heating, uh, also for cooling and greenhouses. So these, uh, these are, the, let's say, the very uh, famous examples of using uh, geothermal as a direct use <laughs> application. When you go more towards the steam system, then uh, of course, electricity production, or if you need a high grade heat for some industrial application, then the, let's say the high entropy geothermal systems becomes very uh, uh, popular there. Um, this is just a bit of give you a kind of a view on what is the installed capacity and the produced energy of the direct use and the power in the um, uh, in the in the world. Uh, so the source of the data is there. And actually, my, my uh, colleague Alex uh, from uh, University of Delft also gave a very detailed introduction to geothermal, uh, which I will invite all of you to also watch that uh, series from our geo hackathon courses. Uh, what you see in general that the share of the direct use is actually way higher than the power production in the, in the system in terms of the installed capacity, but also produced energy. Uh, yeah, you start to see that the, actually the produced energy uh, from the power system gets a bit of a higher share. Uh, uh, that's mainly because of the fact that more or less your uh, uh, geothermal uh, systems for power production, they just running 24-7. And that's very different than the direct use systems, which are quite demand driven. So if you don't have a heat demand, then more or less your production, you just ramp it down. Otherwise you're uh, paying quite a lot of uh, uh, money for uh, getting the asset up and running, but there is no demand for it. For the power is different. It's just connected to the grid and you can produce 24 seven. So the load factors makes it uh, 
uh, into this graph that actually the share of the power production starts to kind of ramp up a little bit. Um, again, a very nice source of uh, reading is this uh, website, Think Geo Energy, which every year they publish this uh, top 10 geothermal countries. And if you see over here from the power production, you see almost all the countries which are really leading this, starting from the United States, Indonesia, Philippines, Turkey. And it's really, let's say, an impressive list to see how these countries are growing into their uh, geothermal power production. And from the other side, if you're looking from the heating purposes, this is a map uh, presented by EGC, which shows, let's say, the, the current install capacity and the locations where you have geothermal for heating. So just to give you a bit of an idea, we have currently more than 360 uh, geothermal district heating projects and systems around the world. Uh, and this is expected to also be triple in the upcoming uh, years. So why actually geothermal for heating is important, why it matters, how it can help us to reach our decarbonization goals. Um, there is, let's say, just to give you a bit of a European perspective, uh, if you look into the percentage of the energy consumption in the different sector, uh, you see that actually, uh, for instance, if you look into the households, around 25% of the energy is actually uh, European-wide is actually used in the households. And zooming a little bit into that, then you see that the space heating is responsible for more than 65% of that energy consumption. And for a space heating in the houses, you do not need a very high temperature. Already what you can produce from the geothermal is actually sufficient to provide it. So if you can actually, instead of using the, the current way of uh, providing space heating, which is based on fossil, if you can decarbonize it with the geothermal, you're gonna have a massive impact uh, in, the, in, the, in the share of the um, fossil fuels for space heating. So I would like to zoom a little bit into the Netherlands because I would like to also start to talk a little bit about the current operational challenges. This is the current status in the Netherlands. It's in Dutch. I'll just take you through this. Um, this uh, geothermal market currently in the Netherlands is really growing. So yeah, the heat is on also in the Netherlands. Currently we have around 36 uh, geothermal systems and mainly for the direct use. I have to say only for the direct use heating application. And uh, the total production is around seven uh, petajoule. Uh, and Traditionally, this system has been used for the horticulture center, uh, sector, so mainly for the greenhouses. And now you start to see that uh, there are lots of plans to extend this also to the built environment. So provide heating to the houses, uh, also cooling to the houses using geothermal as a source. And this is mainly because we need to also decarbonize our uh, space heating, as I showed in the previous graph, and that will have a massive impact on the overall uh, CO2 footprint of the energy system in the Netherlands. Um, the type of systems that we are using in the Netherlands, this is a <clears throat> bit of an overview. So on the right, that uh, I, I show you this uh, geothermal production, so mainly for the production purposes, and you see the other three types, which are also for the thermal energy storage. Uh, what is very important to know that in the Netherlands, we have a geothermal gradient of around 30 degrees per kilometer. So it's a relatively modest uh, geothermal gradient. Uh, that means that, okay, if we look into the current conventional geothermal systems in the Netherlands, between the depth of one and a half to three kilometers, you're expecting to produce something up to 85, 90, 100 degrees. That's the kind of the range that you can produce. So there's gonna be all hot brine system, no steam will be produced. And um, since the, let's say the conversion efficiency is pretty high, since you just need a heat exchanger to extract the heat, then uh, these systems are getting very, very popular in the Netherlands uh, for the two sectors of horticulture and built environment. Um, this is just some numbers to give you a bit of an idea on the type of the system. So just just to kind of uh, give you a bit of a feeling of the of the the configuration of the geothermal plants, there is a producer well and there is an injector well. 
So in this way, you kind of, you have this pair, which is called uh, duplet. They're connected to the same aquifer. So you don't have them that, for instance, one is producing from a deeper uh, layer and then the other one is injecting at the shallower layer. So everything is actually in the same aquifer. You preferably do not want any fault or sealing between the, let's say the two wells. And the whole idea is to produce the hot water, uh, um, extract the heat, but of course you would like to filter the water. There might be some corrosion issues that you want to have inhibitor injection. And there will be gas, which I'll talk about it as well. And after that, when you have the cold water, you just inject it back into the reservoir. I already talked about the geothermal uh, gradient uh, in the Netherlands, give you a bit of a, idea of the volumes that have to be produced, we roughly talk about 120 to 400 Q per hour production. This is uh, yeah, quite high if you compare, for instance, to oil wells. And that's because yeah, well, um, you need to produce much more heat to uh, supply the demand. So looking into the uh, energy content of the gas and the hot water, so the production rate has to be high in order to make the project uh, economic. Um, here I'm showing the salinity as a function of the depth in the Netherlands. So just uh, kind of to summarize this, yes, it's very uh, saline water and it contains a lot of different minerals. I'll uh, talk about it in a few minutes about what sort of challenges you can expect by having uh, such a high salinity. Um, and maybe one point also about this configuration. So it's just a bit of a, a schematic view. Actually, in reality, you do not have these uh, wells to be vertical. So more or less on the surface, they come to the same point. And in the subsurface, you have them uh, deviated and inclined wells, often by like 45 degrees. And they design it in such a way that the distance between the producer and injector will be between one to one and a half kilometers. So in that way, you expect the, the breakthrough time would be in the order of 30 years. So that's, that's a little bit some uh, kind of a rule of thumb for the design of these two geothermal systems in the Netherlands. But what happens during the production? What happens is actually that you produce a hot water that's this hot brine with its salinity, it's actually in equilibrium in the reservoir uh, already for let's say a million years, it has been there. Now you kind of produce them, you change their temperature as they're coming to the surface, the pressure is changing. On the top of the surface, you actually might, for let's say safety reason, just uh, degas it. So if there are some by-produced gas, you want to take that out. Uh, and then you change the temperature and then you put back the cold water into the reservoir. So there are a lot of pressure temperature changes happening in the system. And as a result of this, the, actually the equilibrium of the brine starts to change. And that can give you some issues. And that's gonna be the whole talk that I'm gonna uh, give today. So this is about the very important thing for the operation of this geothermal system. But next to that, uh, one different thing also about the geothermal maybe compared to the, to the, uh, to the oil and gas system is that these direct systems has to meet the demand. So they are actually driven by the demand and demand of the heat is very variable. Already you see this seasonality in the heat demand for well, this famous, uh, we call it the bathtub curve that in the summer you don't need much heat. And yeah, you, you need to design a system. You need to design your facilities to actually deal with such a, let's say variations in the system. And often geothermal, you look at it as a kind of a base load. You don't want to change it that often. So how are you going to deal with this? So operator has to deal with these issues of uh, changing uh, conditions on their brine, and that can give them a lot of uh, um, headaches. Uh, while they have to also meet this uh, heat demand, and it can give a lot of, uh, can be coupled to all these flow chemistry challenges like a scaling and corrosion. So a lot for the operator to take. In this case, it's not just let's maximize the production. Actually, you have to hit the demand, meet the demand. That's that's very important. So comb combining this two, I always have this cartoon that they say, okay, this is the kind of a daily job of a geothermal operator, has to find the optimum of what's the best way to operate the system to meet the demand, not getting any of these um, uh, flow assurance challenges. But as soon as they find the optimum, or the next time step is coming, which means that they have to go to a, the next optimum control. So it is a very, let's say, going to be a tedious job for the operators, and they have to really find protocols and methods to help them making a better decision. Already talking about the heat demand, well, already on the 
design phase is a pretty challenging question. So imagine you have such a heat demand. How are you going to design your geothermal system? So you want to go a little bit geothermal as a base load. What should be the minimum that you can provide to you? Are you going to have a storage potential? Do you have locations to actually seasonally store this heat? But what are you going to do with the peak loads? And if you do your peak loading with some gas boiler, of course, there will be also emission penalties for the work that you're doing. So how can you bring all of them together to supply this heat for the security of the supply? Do not have any downtime, but the initial sizing of your system should be already efficient to meet this heat demand for a district uh, or for, a, let's say, a set of greenhouses that you're supplying heat to. So it's very different, it's difficult, but often if you talk to geothermal community, the biggest challenge is always about investment costs. It's about drilling costs, completion costs. Go, go, do we go uh, single uh, barrier or double barrier casing? What sort of material do we use? Everything is kind of driven by the investment. Everything is driven by the initial cost, by more or less the capital expenditure. And often the operational expenditure is being forgotten. But if you have a very beautiful geothermal system, which you think, okay, I've studied the subsurface. I know I have a very good aquifer. I can access this heat. I can, I can produce. But if tomorrow, for instance, you get a sand production, you have to ramp down your production. You even have to stop your production. So sometimes those operational issues and the cost that will be associated with it, that they could also be a killer of the business case. And yeah, just for that, I always have this, again, another video as, as let's say someone who always tried to think about the future problem. Do I get a breakthrough in 20 years or 30 years? And actually this uh, fox here is actually your operational problem. They're just next door, you know? Like you get a corrosion, you get a leakage, that's it. You have to stop the production. You have to do a costly repair. And yeah, you can't really supply that heat. So don't forget about the operational uh, um, issues and how to deal with them. And what I'm saying is also supported by the numbers. So this is a survey that we have done in a program called Warming Up. This report is actually publicly available where we collect a lot of information from the uh, CAPEX and the OPEX of the geothermal systems. And we made some comparison between these operators. And one very interesting thing is um, we have two operators here. All the numbers are normalized because of the confidentiality. Uh, what we have is that we have one of one case that the operator, their um, annual OPEX was eight, around 8% of their uh, total cost. The total cost is actually the, your total COPEX plus the, let's say, the annual OPEX. So this is a quite a high share because you expect that your OPEX should be roughly, let's say, 3 to 5%. We had another operator which had only 3%. So that's the operational cost was really, really uh, lower compared to the other operator. And what you see is that the second operator, they spend much more uh, money for their design of the wells, for the sand control, for the materials that they have chosen for their casing and the service facility. So for much higher CAPEX. And then they can already see that it's kind of paying off in much lower OPEX that they have in the system. And these are not just because that the COPEX is higher, the percentage is going low. If you look into the absolute uh, numbers, you don't see numbers, but if you look into the trend, you already see that even though the COPEX is higher, but in, in also absolute term, their OPEX was lower. So this is very, very important to know that if you take the OPEX into account, maybe you go for a higher COPEX, but that ensures that over the longer period, your system will not be interrupted by some of these operational issues. <laughs> So um, I would like to give you a bit of, a, um, yeah, I, for the rest of the time, I would like to take you through some of the items with respect to the operational uh, issues. Here you see the overview of the cost, the operational cost that the different operators are uh, uh, dealing with. So the first operator, of course, had quite a large cost because of the production wells and the issues that they had with the corrosions in the wells. And the second one, because of the much better materials they use, that part was much smaller. Uh, still having the pumps, which contributes quite a lot to your operational cost. I would like to go to some of these flow chemistry challenges in the geothermal system, just to give you some ideas about what sort of issues these uh, operators are dealing with it. And of course, the first one is always coming to the top of the list is corrosion. So this is very important because you want to make sure that the integrity of your wells and facilities is there for at least 30 years. 
Uh, but production from geothermal reservoirs is challenging. You have all the conditions that you need for corrosion. You have a salty brine, you have high temperature, and also you have dissolved CO2, sometimes even more than 10 mole percent. Uh, so you have to be careful about this, and you can get different uh, way of uh, uh, corrosions in the system. Yeah, you see, the, let's say, this uh, um, cartoon here of uh, showing the different type of the corrosion. Currently, the most important, uh, let's say, uh, um, way to mitigate and control this is, of course, monitor the corrosion. Uh, and inhibitor injection is, is also one of the uh, um, very regular practices for uh, controlling the corrosion. We see now there are more uh, uh, developments in the market to go also for uh, GRE liners. Uh, so in this case, you do not have metal contacts with a, with a brine in the production well, and then you can minimize your corrosion risk. What's very important if you look into most of the early wells in the Netherlands, they have been designed with a single barrier. So this is, a, let's say, an example of a completion. There is no production tubing or liner. There's just a single barrier. So you actually start to produce your salty brine at high temperature in the production well. There is just a single barrier, but also initially most of these uh, wells were uh, designed with uh, carbon steel or very low alloy steels. So that already know that why corrosion was kind of an uh, issue in this case. And okay, you can inject corrosion inhibitors, there's no problem with there, but the rates are high. So even for injecting only 5 or 10 ppm of corrosion inhibitor continuously, you, in the end, yearly, you're going to pay a lot of materials because you have to kind of provide 10 ppm to 400 Q per hour of the brine. So that those costs, eventually you have to see, oh, does it make sense? Maybe in the beginning, I should have already gone with much better material for my casing. So always make sure that even if you're designing a new geothermal system, you have to be careful about these operational issues and already take that into account during the design phase. And if not, Always monitoring and way to mitigate it is something that you have to keep a close eye into this. The second problem is the scaling. So the scaling is actually the part because you have, let's say, this salty brine with different minerals in this. And at a certain point, because you change the condition, you kind of, at some conditions, you make it very favorable for these minerals to come out of the solution. And you have different type of scaling. You have carbon scaling, you have sulfate uh, scaling, uh, and if you, in principle, look into all the geothermal systems, so here I show the calcite and uh, barite, uh, uh, let's say, um, um, equilibrium at the, what we call it, an infinite, infinite dissolution. And uh, in the salty, let's say, water, you already see that you go way above the, let's say, the, the saturation line. So the, the, the chance of getting this sort of carbonate and sulfate scaling in the system, if the minerals exist, is pretty high. Uh, currently, mainly with the corrosion inhibitors, they have been controlled. The carbonate scaling, you can also inject CO2 to modify the pH and uh, deal with that. But you already know that, okay, modifying the pH by injecting CO2 in the system to deal with the carbonate scaling means that you increase the risk of the corrosion. And you have to find some optimal. So in the end, you inject CO2, your scaling problem is gone, you get a corrosion issue, and then you have to inject the corrosion inhibitors. And no problem, you can control it, but these are all costs. The, the other type of, just get a bit of water. The other type of scaling is actually what we call the heavy metal scaling. So this has to do with um, having some dissolved lead or copper in the system. I show you some of these, the low entropy geothermal systems in Denmark, Germany, and uh, Netherlands. I'm looking into the uh, concentration of the lead, which they are producing. But one thing which is very tricky about this uh, type of scaling is that if you get this scaling in the system, then this deposit actually will create a medium uh, which will lead into the galvanic corrosion because you will get two different metals contact. So when you get the lead being formed on your uh, metal, you get lead on top of steel and that can lead into the galvanic corrosion. So it's a <laughs> very tricky one to deal with. Uh, also common in, uh, in, in some of the geothermal reservoirs. Yeah, inhibitors could, could be a solution for this, but you have to also carefully uh, select this. Uh, but it also has to do with how you're going to actually design your pipes and select the pipe materials. There are ways to, it can also filter, so you can have some particle filters as well for this. 
uh, and some innovations going on in this venue, which in few slides I will also show you uh, some of these innovations. Um, the other issue is NORM, so the natural occurring radioactive materials. And um, this is not a very new problem in, in oil and gas as well. There we also see a lot of these uh, NORM issues. The only difference here is that uh, the volumes that we are producing in geothermal, they are very high. So if you can find a way to even filter these materials, then the amount of material that you have uh, deposited on the filters, they exceed uh, the kind of the this uh, rate maximum concentration that you're allowed to have. And then the disposal cost and the treatment cost will go really high. And just to make life even more difficult, this um, uh, in back in 2018, the maximum allowed radioactive concentration has been minimized by a factor 10. So from 100 becquerels per gram, it has been reduced to 10 becquerels per gram. And that just makes it even more costly because then the deposits, well, it's still the same brine, still contain the same amount of, uh, uh, let's say, lead, lead 210 or radium 226. And that would just makes it more difficult. So this is also an issue, which, of course, any innovation in this way on how you can mitigate it, keep it dissolved or do something with the, with the, with the filters is always appreciated from the, from the sector. And this is not the only challenge. There are other challenges as well. And just looking into the time, I can't go to all of them. But just to list them, there are sand production issues, uh, particle migration, uh, especially you see these issues in the shallower reservoirs in the Netherlands because of the unconsolidated sand. Uh, and if you do not design your completion well, if you don't have any sand control strategy, uh, then in principle, well, you have to ramp down your production or well, every week you probably have to take uh, kilos of uh, sand from your separator and your surface facility. So this is a very important one. Injectivity decline as well. Uh, so this could be actually a, a mix of different things that can lead into the injectivity decline. It can be induced by the microbial activity. It could be because of scaling, it could be because of the particles. But there are examples of geothermal system that because of the injectivity re reduction, they have to also ramp down the production. And that means that the overall performance of the system had to be dropped. And one other last uh, issue, operational challenge is actually uh, the gas production. So you can also get gas to be produced with your geothermal brine, uh, depending on the type of gas. So whether it's CO2 or oxygen, which can give you uh, corrosion risk, or if it's a natural gas, so you have to treat it very well. You have to be careful with all the safety uh, issues around this. Uh, so it's not, the, let's say, an unknown problem, but uh, how to manage the by-produced gas is, of course, a very, very important uh, operational. Uh, this is, let's say, a bit of a side remark that I would like to refer you to this project called PERFORM. This was a European project where a lot of these issues have been listed. A lot of inputs from the sector came here and we provided a best practice on how to deal with the scaling corrosion issues in geothermal systems and what would be the best protocols to sample your brine. So please go to this uh, website as well if you're interested on this topic and then uh, uh, access the guidelines where there's a lot of useful information in this uh, Another thing is about these downhole pumps. So downhole pumps are also quite crucial in the geothermal system. The costs are high, uh, but these are also the heart of the geothermal system. So if you want to produce water, uh, you need to have this artificial lift in, uh, in, in most of the geothermal uh, reservoirs around the world. But they relatively have, well, short lifetime might be a bit of a too strong word, but I would say shorter than expected. And uh, we have to look a little bit carefully into, okay, why do we see uh, shorter lifetime in these geothermal wells for your uh, ESPs, for your electrical submersible pumps, compared to what you see, for instance, in the oil wells? And look into it a little bit, deep dive into it, and better understand what is actually happening in the geothermal, which makes it different than oil wells. And can we find some root causes for these more frequent failures? Um, a, a lot of, let's say, research was done in this uh, topic. There is a very nice list of uh, 
things which we, has been found that whether it has to do with the environment of the geothermal, so what you're actually producing, human environments, and also design operations, some highlights of this, I'll, I'll bring it into my, uh, into my next uh, slide. But in general, you see that uh, on average, these uh, pumps are running around two years. This is coming from the data that have been uh, there. Also, there are cases which these ESPs were only running for, uh, let's say, only nine days as well. Uh, so it's very important to look a little bit uh, into the depth of this. For the time purpose, I would like to just uh, go to this slide. Um, this is some potential reasons why these geothermal ESPs have a shorter lifetime. And one could be fluid composition. So you have a very uh, well nasty ge geothermal brine composition with all these ions and uh, dissolved gas that they can give all sort of... Uh, corrosions and uh, um, uh, scaling issues, which reduce your uh, uh, pump performance. In general, if you look into the geothermal systems, their installation depth compared to oil wells is much shallower. So if you have a well of two to three kilometers, these are the, let's say the ESP depth installed in the Netherlands, which goes from, let's say, uh, around 300 meters to one kilometers. So what happens is of course, if you get this, start up and shut down of the system, the temperature that the ESP will see will be quite a broad range of the temperature. So this can potentially lead to some thermal fatigue and material failure. So this, this is of course important one, there is no sign of this, but it's always good to take into account that there are differences between geothermal ESPs and oil and gas uh, ESPs. We are producing high volumetric uh, flow rates. That's already explained that of course the, energy content in the in the hot water is very different than oil than oil and gas so your volumes are high and imagine this high uh, volumetric flow rates are combined with temperature and high salinity water so it becomes quite uh, challenging uh, but one very important thing is this seasonal demand and the flexibility that you have in your geothermal system so these pumps of course have a recommended operating range but if you look into those recommended operating range they are still smaller compared to the uh, demand that you have in the geothermal uh, you, you need from the geothermal system so your pump has to go kind of beyond the operating range and that's of course not recommended and this can be a kind of a, a initiation of the of the failures in the system and the last one is less experienced operator so this of course is, again is quite a, let's say a, strong remark uh, because there are also a lot of people from the petroleum sector with experience which goes but often the, yeah how to deal with this sort of systems could also be just new to some of the operators and we have to also acknowledge this and if in any ways operators can be supported and assisted to make a better decision about their how to deal with the esp how to increase the frequency reduce the frequency that can always be helped and there we see a big role also for the digitalization. So how you can use digital technologies, how you can use predictive models, show them in real time to the operators to say, oh, I mean, you're getting into an off-normal event, you're getting into an anomaly, your pump is about to fail, so do something about it. And this is, again, also a case study which we have shown uh, for an ESP system in the Netherlands, that this ESP actually has failed in, uh, in, in January 21. Uh, and we've just... So, okay, what if this operator would have some models which has been trained on their historical data and they were just running in real time in the system and give them some ideas about how currently their ESP is performing? Can we actually detect some of these failures before they happen? Because then in that way, you can provide that alarm to the operator. And it created multiple models, which I showed three of them to you. So model temperature of the pump, ESP vibration and ESP power. And what you see that already that the, if this is the point of the failure of the component, already the first signs using this model can be detected uh, even six months before they happen. So if this operator had this model to monitor the ESP vibration based on the historical data that they had, they could detect that this ESP vibration already a few months before the failure is not normal. So they have to do something about it. The least you can do is actually you can order the pump, have it in the warehouse, and then as soon as it fails, you can replace it. That could be the minimum thing that you can do. But yeah, if it just fails at this point and you have to wait, order a new pump, again, there will be a lot of downtime. That is something that you don't want. All right, so I've showed you a lot of uh, challenges. Um, 
Of course, the big driver is is, is cost uh, because you need to ensure that uh, not only the high complex is important, but operational cost could also be a problem and operational issues can be a problem. Uh, but most important thing for this geothermal, which we use for the heating applications is that uh, the infrastructure is also needed. So you might have a very good reservoir that you can produce hot water with high rates from this, but you need infrastructure to kind of transport this heat for the end use, whether it's in the greenhouse or whether it's in the house, uh, you need ha to have that infrastructure. So the demand side and how to kind of transport it there is very important. But of course, from the cost side, and when today I talk a lot about these operational issues, we see that innovation could be very, very important here. So we, we actually with innovation, you can find ways to reduce this cost, make the geothermal system operation more smooth, and uh, yeah, in the end, help to accelerate this uh, energy, uh, geothermal energy in, in, the, in the sector. Uh, yeah, we work on several innovation. I think again, for the time reason, I will be very quick on this. I already talked about these lead deposits, which if they go into your system, whether they uh, you get it, let's say in the heat exchangers or in the pipe system or somewhere in the well, as soon as they deposit, they would lead into corrosion. So one of the uh, innovative ideas that we work in perform two projects with some of our partners in uh, Denmark and Germany is that we're going to come up with a new filter technology, which is going to extract some of these ions. In this case, specifically, it will be lead, barium, and copper. And you're going to put it at the point where you want to kind of preferentially absorb these materials to kind of protect the downstream components. So in principle, if you see where you have a more, can get the more scaling and corrosion issues as a result of lead, if it's on the cold side of it, what if you actually deploy this filter on the hot side of your heat exchangers to kind of extract all of this? And that means when you do the cooling in the heat exchangers, you do not have to worry about any scaling and corrosion issues. This is gonna give you big savings with respect to corrosion inhibitors and also the potential risk of if that corrosion happens anyway, there will be big costs for, uh, let's say, um, changing your heat exchanges and surface facilities. So here are like one of the innovative approaches that you can also minimize the, the chemical uh, footprint of your system by injecting less inhibitors or even no inhibitors in the system. I will also skip this. I'll go to another uh, uh, innovative approach is, is the project where we are looking into using, uh, uh, so in the previous project we were thinking of minimizing the use of uh, chemicals. In this project, we actually want to add an extra chemical in the system, but we see also some uh, very positive response in terms of the um, cost reduction. And here we are looking into the use of drag reducing agents. as so these are surfactants or long uh, molecular chain polymers, which with a very small amount you can add to the system and you can get a huge reduction in your pumping power. So this is a very well-known concept. And now in the project called Draglow with the consortium, we are uh, uh, looking into using this sort of uh, technologies to minimize the cost. And if you have already an existing geothermal or district heating system, you can just inject these materials and directly minimize your pumping power. But the interesting thing is that if you want to design a new system, you always go for the large uh, casing and uh, uh, pipes because you want to minimize your pumping power. But if you can go to one smaller size casing on the or the pipe, what can actually happen is that you can keep your pumping power the same by injecting this DRA. So already you can also think about COPEX reduction by minimizing your drilling size, uh, drilling rig that you need, because if you go to the smaller casing, you also need a dr smaller drilling rig. You can go to a smaller district heating network uh, pipes, and in that way, your overall cost will, will be minimized. All right, so some examples of uh, innovations here as well. Uh, again, this is a very nice one. So we showed that actually in this case, we can minimize uh, the pumping power by actually 70% using some existing uh, surfactants in the market. All right. Um, I would like to end uh, my presentation uh, with these uh, slides about whether actually we have all this operational cost 
um, to produce heat, which we also saw that okay, the the, the value or the, the 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 price of the heat is way lower than uh, gas. The energy content of that is also lower. So we go through all this hassle to to actually decarbonize our um, uh, heating, but actually is geothermal a sustainable source? And the argument could be, well, you have pumps in the system. The pumps are consuming a lot of energy. And so far, the the, the, um, the electricity grid still is running by uh, the, 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 let's say, the share of the fossil for power production is still pretty high. So that's the, let's say, one way that you um, contribute to the emission. The second is that you're also producing a lot of gas. You're producing CO2. In the Netherlands, we're also producing uh, natural gas. I can show you the share of the uh, ratio of the natural gas to the CO2 for the different countries. And you can see in the Netherlands, there is a large amount of natural gas which is being produced by, uh, by the geothermal fleet. And the ratio is also high. So in some, uh, some of the formations in the Netherlands, for every cube of the water that you produce, you also produce one cube of gas. So you're roughly, if you're producing 300 cube per hour of brine, you're producing 300 cube per hour of uh, gas. So is it actually sustainable? And okay, for that, you always have to have some measures. We took two measures, which one of them is based on the climate agreement and the other one is based on the heat act, which says, okay, you have to kind of go with this criteria of, uh, roughly between 20 to 25 kilograms of the CO2 per gigajoule of the energy that you produce. And if you can achieve that by 2030, 2050, then that's the point that you can say, okay, yeah, I'm, then then we kind of meet this uh, agreement that we have. So we look into some of the geothermal systems in Europe and also around the world where on the left, you see mainly the low entropy system. And you see the Dutch systems next to the systems in France, Denmark, and Hungary. And these are all based on the public data. So maybe there are some pluses, minuses here. Um, but we look into the emission which comes from the system, which the light green is actually the part that is the power consumption of the pump. And then the dark green is the part which comes from the formation gas which is being produced. So you already see that maybe in some countries the formation gas is really high, but in general you're expecting between, yeah, something in the order of uh, between five to ten kilograms of CO2 per kilojoule that you are producing from the geothermal systems. And you, if you look into the kind of a bigger perspective, where you also bring the geothermal power production sites and compare it with coal, oil, and gas. Uh, you see that the, the emissions of the low entropy geothermal systems are pretty low compared to oil and gas systems. There are still some geothermal plants in the world that are producing, uh, uh, looking into the emission factor might look high, but uh, of course there, there is also quite a high share of natural gas and CO2 which is being produced from this well. So please take this with a, with a pinch of salt. You know, if you have to kind of normalize it based on the energy content that you're producing, still these values would also be much lower. So compared to what we get from the fossil sources, yes, it is a sustainable source. And this will be my last slide because I would like to just not talk about only geothermal system. In the end, everything is demand driven. So if you want to look into your emission, you have to look into the emission you make from the source, but also from the transport of the heat from the source to the demand. So in this case, we also look into the case where you have a geothermal as a source, but the heat has to be transported and you have some uh, boiler on the way to make sure that those peak loads are also met. And in that way, we look into the full system from the emission perspective. So here you see the different reservoirs over the years and we have this uh, green ones, which are the geothermal contribution. In gray, we have the part, which is actually the, the boiler. So the additional heat that in the network that you need. And then the orange one, which is the heat losses that you would expect in the in the system. So you put, need to put additional energy to meet that, uh, to kind of compensate for that loss. And that also contributes to your overall emission. So if we see this, it's, it's, it seems that uh, since we expect that the share of the power uh, production and actually the share of renewables in the power will uh, uh, grow very fast in the Netherlands, uh, the part which is actually responsible for the uh, power consumption of the pumps in the geothermal system will be reduced. And that's already can significantly contribute 
to minimizing the emissions from the from the systems. And in this way, if you continue by the year 20XX, which I hope that will be 2050, yes, we're gonna go with all this uh, requirements of the climate agreement and the heat act that yes, this will be a sustainable source. But of course, take one of the assumption that we had that we say, okay, this additional energy required in the, in the network would actually be by a gas boiler. And that has been kept constant. Of course, your demand is evolving, but most important thing is that you would look for alternative methods to provide this additional energy. Could be maybe biomass, could be electrical heating. So there also, this value would also change. So for taking all this conservative assumption, we still see that geothermal and the district heating are sustainable source, and they're going to contribute to the decarbonization of the heats. So with that, some summary or uh, take home messages. Uh, I'll start from the end. Geothermal energy is a sustainable source for heat and power. Uh, I didn't talk much about the power as it's not really also the focus in the Netherlands. So I wanted to deep dive a little bit to the type of system you see in the Netherlands, uh, give you a little bit that perspective from the heating and direct use application. We see innovation is very important because actually this methods to harvest this uh, geothermal uh, energy and heat, they already been around, especially for the type of system that I've shown already. Uh, there was this interesting remark that, uh, yeah, in principle, they are uh, uh, high water cut uh, oil wells. Yeah, so there's just uh, this sort of system. Yeah, you know, in oil and gas, we are very well uh, um, get used to this sort of system. The production rates are higher. The chemistry of the brine is different, but the technologies to deploy this uh, heat is already there. The most important thing is cost. So if you can have innovation to minimize that cost in any way, this is very well appreciated. And of course, the last remark will be about the optimum exploitation of the geothermal energy that is not only driven by the capital expenditure, Operational expenditures are very important. You have to take that into account. You have to know them very well and try to find ways to minimize that as much as possible. Even make them fully autonomous. Uh, if you have very nice materials, if you control everything, you can even make them fully autonomous and make them uh, provide your base load uh, perfectly without much hassles. So that was my presentation. Uh, I hope I could give you some uh, ideas about some of these uh, uh, operational challenges, but most importantly, the importance of these operational challenges and uh, how to deal with it. Yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to, to take them. And you can always contact me on LinkedIn or send me an email if you want to have a detailed chat about these topics. Right, Benjamin, thank you very much. Uh, we've already got quite a few questions. Uh, Graham was the first one. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question direct, or should I just read it from the chat box? Uh, we could read it from the chat, chat box, but I did two questions. One is the amount of power that's used in the pumps, uh, which you almost answered in your presentation. And the other one was about the gas produced, the methane. Can the methane be used? Uh, uh, how much yeah. methane is produced? Uh, does the methane reduce as you circulate uh, water around? Uh, yeah, a very good question. So the, the pump power is, of course, uh, is also driven by your production rate and the, the sizing that you have. So roughly, you see these values that can vary from, let's say, half a megawatt to, let's say, one, one and a half megawatts. That, that's the range. So there might be lower and higher values. But just to give you a bit of a feeling, whether it's like uh, 100 kilowatts or it's 10 megawatts. So that's the bit of the range that you're dealing with. But of course, you would like to minimize them. So you, if you go for, let's say, more efficient uh, pumps, or if you go for the larger tubings, then you can also save quite a lot in your um, pump power. There are also some which has a lower consumption. So that's that's a uh, one, one thing. And the second was about the, the methane. So yes, the methane is also in some of the sites being utilized. So there is also few of the sites which are using uh, combined heat and power, where they kind of extract the natural gas from the separator. They take it into the CHP unit and uh, part of the uh, power consumption of the pump, they could even also just directly get it from the natural gas that they produce. So it's already being uh, utilized in that sense. Uh, there are already... Uh, examples of that in the Netherlands, but maybe also in other parts of Europe. 
As you're circulating gas round and round, does the amount of gas that comes out uh, reduce over time? Uh, over time. So, so the thing is, uh, uh, yes, I think somewhere in the presentation I mentioned that the breakthrough time, you're talking about 30 years. Yeah. So I think it's difficult to make any guesses around that. Um, but I think except for one system in the Netherlands, all the systems, they have separators. There is only one system in the Netherlands that they keep everything under pressure and they have no degassing. So the gases stay dissolved. Mm -hmm. Some gas maybe still will be in the gaseous form and they just inject it back into the reservoir. But uh, yeah, for, for most of the system, they just degas it. They keep some CO2 in the solution. So they try to, for that calcite problem, keep some CO2 in the solution. But uh, yeah, most of the gas will just be... Uh, utilized yeah it's quite common in uh, in holland to have a boiler for the uh, for the off gas uh, so uh, yeah uh, the gas is not wasted yeah. uh, okay uh the next question came from ra uh do you want to unmute yourself and ask uh, about single barrier RA. Okay, so the question was about single barrier. Uh, what are the safety environmental considerations? Brine is a lot saltier uh, than near surface groundwater, plus unexpected gas bubbles or slugs. Yeah, so very good question. That's the whole reason that uh, since a few years ago, there are actually some uh, guidelines proposed by um, Geothermal Netherlands organization. Uh, which is a branch organization for the geothermal operators where they kind of uh, put that thing in perspective, the single barrier is not a good idea. There are a lot of uh, uh, safety risks, integrity risks. Um, and if something goes wrong, of course, the work cover also will be very costly. So for that reason, yes, yeah, single barrier. So there, there was a reason that they have been designed like this because they wanted just to maximize the surface area uh, for maximizing the production with the minimum frictional losses. So that's the main, main, main reason. But of course, because of uh, easier ways to monitor the integrity of the well for this environmental risk and things like that, of course, uh, none of the wells uh, will be single barrier. There will be a production tubing uh, or a GRE liner, and there will be, there has to be a kind of a monitoring plan submitted uh, regularly. So in that way, they try to do this. With respect to unexpected gas bubbles and slugs, um, it's not of that much issue, to be honest. At least, again, in the Netherlands, so there are other cases in Europe which there are slugging issues, but in this case, you, have, you, are, you need to have a kind of a critical fraction between your gas and liquid to actually initiate those slugging. And so since most of these wells are kind of uh, operated at the higher surface pressure because of the minimizing of the calcite problem, you don't expect much uh, slugging issue on the surface. Okay. Uh, I can't see you uh, online. Yeah, thank you very much. A great presentation. I really enjoyed it. I just have a quick question on uh, on a slide number 21. There was a picture. Uh, maybe you could uh, explain a bit what was this uh, plugging material. Is it uh, some fines together with some microbiological product or, or what, what, what do we really see there? Yeah. Yeah, so again, you always see kind of uh, well, what I call it, the kind of a uh, soup of issue over there. So, I mean, there are cases that uh, you see, uh, let's say, a lot of uh, uh, clays and, uh, and the particles and sand uh, kind of uh, uh, being clogged. Um, but also, for instance, uh, there have been tiny amount of oil also has been observed in one of these cases. And if you bring them together in a kind of a, a filter, then you start to see this sort of, let's say, muddy shape uh, uh, structures over here. Um, so that's, that. again, there are lots of causes can be for this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, clogging and often they just combine together. So that's, that's a bit of the issue with this, uh, let's say, clogging. Okay, thanks, Petra. Uh, Marius, uh, do you want to ask your questions about PCP pumps?
No, maybe not. Okay, so were PCP pumps uh, considered? Uh, metal metal rods are uh, already developed and available on the market. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is an excellent question. So, um, of course, PCP, jet pumps, or even gas lifts, so different, I mean, if you look into the artificial lift portfolio, you would see a, quite a broad list of possibilities. Um, I mean, yeah, let's face it. And at these high rates that we want to produce in geothermal, ESP is the most efficient one. So all the other pumping uh, um, um, mechanisms that you want to think about, and if you want to go for a gas lift, eventually you're putting too much power in the system. And that's not going to be economic. So I think uh, for these systems, ESP was uh, was uh, was chosen. And if you look into the economics, they they make sense for these high rates. Uh, for much higher temperature applications, one of the very common type of pump is also line shaft pumps. So in that way, you kind of uh, protect all your uh, uh, motor and electrical component on the surface, and you just kind of uh, transfer the power to a shaft. Uh, still on the vertical side of the well, you can utilize this uh, maybe for the uh, built environment and doing it in the urban areas might be a bit of a difficulty because of the noise generated. But uh, yeah, I think uh, these things has been looked into and it's still ESP is, uh, is, is the most um, efficient one. Okay, thanks. Alwyn, you've got some um, information to share and potentially a question. Yes. Um, first of all, uh, Prishman, this was a, a, a very good presentation, a very engaging, very insightful. Um, I was happy that you were able to bring out the, uh, the alternative of uh, GRE, or fiberglass lining of steel tubing or casing used in, in geothermal wells. I just wanted to add, for the interest of the forum, that um, fiberglass um, has its temperature limitations with regards to uh, geothermal applications. I know we've supplied into the Netherlands, but you would only be able to rely on fiberglass for temperatures within uh, 145 degrees uh, Celsius. Um, and I think uh, it's okay for me to announce that very recently at, a, at an AMPP, which used to be formerly NACE uh, event uh, here in the US, I introduced uh, a thermoplastic lining system uh, which takes lining of carbon steel into the 500 degrees Fahrenheit plus regime. So that solution is out there for anyone who's uh, studying uh, alternatives to the exotic uh, steel pipes that are typically uh, considered for geothermal well designs. I just wanted to share that information in this forum. And thanks yeah. for, for giving the opportunity. Yeah, no, th thanks a lot for uh, for sharing this. Thing. But maybe also of, of, of interest also in one of our uh, laboratory, which is in RiceVac, uh, it's called RiceVac Center for Geo uh, Science. Uh, we also made a pilot for a uh, for a GRE well uh, for the thermal storage application. Uh, so that's also one of the things that with some of the, let's say, companies in the Netherlands, we have uh, we have made this possible. And now currently we also have all these fiber uh, optics and uh, distributed temperature sensors, which uh, we would like to monitor the whole subsurface as well. But we definitely see that this GRE is now uh, picking up very fast. And there are already, let's say, uh, examples of the GRE lined uh, geothermal wells in the Netherlands. So that's also already existing. And thanks a lot for sharing that. Yeah. Right, Benjamin, talking about sharing, uh, we're recording uh, this session and we will share that. Uh, we can also, uh, also share your slides as well, correct? Yeah, um, these are all public material, so I can make it available to all the Good. registrants. Uh. Right, and then uh, Daria, I believe you're next. You want to unmute yourself? Um, hello. Uh, thanks Hi. a lot for the presentation. Yeah. It was uh, really interesting, lots of useful information. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, I understand that it might not be uh, your area, but maybe you can guide me in the right direction. I'm wondering uh, about uh, regulations of the geothermal energy in the EU, uh, because I was reading on the subject and I found 
that uh, there are two types of overlaps in this area. First, between pieces of legislation that are usually applied to uh, the petroleum industry. Sometimes they do apply to the geothermal, sometimes they don't. Um, also, uh, there is this hierarchy between uh, the national law and the EU regulations. What overrides what in which country? So it's a uh, really very complicated legislative field. And I would like to read more on this topic to get more clear picture. Yeah, indeed. So that's, the, of course, a very, very relevant uh, question. Indeed, it's, it's not really in my, let's say, venue. But I mean, what you see is that... Uh, um, this sort of, let's say, uh, legislations, the guidelines, those sort of things for geothermal, they are just now start to kind of be formed. So it's not yet as, as uh, formal and as well described as you see, for instance, in the petroleum sector. But this is something that I think all the countries are talking about it, uh, even at the EU level. Um, but I mean, also one of my observations that when you say about like uh, what is overruling what in it, my my observation is if if you see for instance uh, a lot of um, discussions and activities if I take uh, hydrogen as an example these are coming let's say um, top down you know they're like big plans and they try to even talk about let's say national European international scales and that's how the whole development is being drive when we look into the heat most of these sort of let's say initiatives are quite bottom up. It starts with the region, it starts with the municipality, uh, and I think kind of ends at the national level. There might be some levels that European and worldwide we can share and exchange ideas and uh, uh, maybe some, let's say, guidelines and things like that, but probably you see that most of these things are going to be driven nationally. That's that's a little bit my personal opinion, you know, not uh, not anything else, but that's a little bit how I'm observing that the, a lot of these initiatives are quite uh, uh, bottom up and probably these legislations and those sort of things would also be a little bit driven like that. So I don't know if there will be in the future, instead of uh, API, we will have, I don't know, an AGI for geothermal. I don't know about that or EGI if you want to make it European, but in that sense, uh, we, we're going to wait and see how the market evolves and how this uh, legislation guidelines going to evolve. So I, I always give some some ideas. Please look into, for instance, the EGEC website. They they contain a mm -hmm. lot of uh, interesting information about what's happening in Europe, then link to the latest mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mineral Act, uh, which also now links very well with our geothermal development. So they, they share a lot of information there. Hopefully they will be useful for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. And uh, yeah, we already answered questions about sharing the presentation. So thank you, Romania. And um, Frank, uh, you had a question, I believe. Yeah, th thanks for the presentation. On one of the first slides, you also showed the closed loop systems. And uh, at least as I understood, a lot of the operational issues that you mentioned with regard to scaling corrosion would be reduced with these systems. But of course, I mean, they are not as proven as the open systems yet. So uh, what's your view on the potential of these systems getting more and more applied in geothermal systems and projects? Yeah, <coughs> so indeed, that's that's the kind of the very um, direct uh, um, and observable gain from this closed loop system is that you more or less design your uh, geothermal fluid or working fluid yourself. You do it with any properties that you envision to have. You can uh, tune it for the temperature ranges that you have and all the potential scaling, corrosion, erosion issues, you can actually uh, mitigate it there. Plus you can also design it in such a way that your pumping power will be minimized. So more or less, if you go into some sort of a thermosiphon effect that as soon as you heat it up, the kind of the working fluid transport upwards on its own, then you can also minimize your pumping power uh, quite a lot. So that those are the gains. But of course, as we said, especially closed loop systems for the for the deeper uh, system. So now we're talking about uh, uh, kilometers of the closed loop system. Um, these are things that it still has to be piloted and evaluated in terms of the performance. Uh, especially the long-term performance of these sort of systems. So that is something which is also, I think, an exciting time to 
to wait and see how these uh, systems uh, will uh, perform. Uh, and of course, for the shallower systems, the more this borehole uh, heat exchangers, uh, which often also called uh, ground source heat pumps, these are quite proven uh, technology. So uh, in that sense, closed loop is already a proven technology, but we don't know how they will be performing at this uh, deeper depth and this additional topics that you have to go deep would actually be paid off. That's the thing that we have to still wait and see how the system will perform. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah, sure, thanks. Right, and I think that is our time is up. Uh, so I wanna thank everybody um for joining in if you have any more questions uh then feel free to reach out to uh, uh pitchman or myself uh we are back again next month the 20th of june uh spe croatia uh are our hosts uh and i hope i get the name right dragutin uh, domitrovic uh will talk about uh development of the geothermal business in croatia which i believe is going to be slightly hotter than the netherlands so we're going to be warming up even more right so thank you very much uh give us a, a, a one or two days to uh load up the recording and the slides and then we'll send uh, everybody a link uh, with where to uh, uh, download uh, the recording uh, and the PDF of the documents. Pedgeman, I want to thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, talk uh, and conversation. And thanks to all of you for all your questions. And we'll see you again in a month's time. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.